Welcome to Get After It with Nashi, brought to you by Ace Property Management and Sales. Good. Well, yeah, Lev, thank you very much for joining me and uh, welcome to the Get After It podcast. It's I've been trying to get you for a while, we try to get in touch for a while, and it was a mutual friend of ours, Dean Stott, that said, uh, just keep going, Nashi. He's a busy man. He's always out and about. He's always getting, getting after <laughs> it and going places. But then with the release of The Art of Exploration, I thought, what a great time to get back in touch and just sort of explore the book with you and, and listen to what took you to, to writing the new book, but also just sort of what, what's behind you and behind all your adventures. So thank you and welcome to the show. Brilliant. Well, thank you for your uh, for your patience and persistence. I'm glad it paid off. No, no, it certainly has. And just following everything that you've done for so long now, and I mean, I, I know you'll get asked a lot of the same questions and you'll go through a lot of the same stuff regularly because the, the, the adventures and the, the tours that you've gone on, they are, they're so epic. And they're so, for, for someone like me, who is, I would say, your average Joe, your average guy that goes on holiday and tries to do adventures and then and to get out there and do what I can, the way you've embraced life it, it is not is, is uncommon to the point of... Oh, thanks very much. <laughs> in a good way to the point of that I want to say to you that you're, you're quite comfortable being homeless from all the, the things that I've watched and the, the way you tour the world. <laughs> well, you know, it's been a, it's been a wild ride. Um, I've, I've been very, very lucky and very privileged in many ways to be able to travel the way that I've done. And um, certainly, you know, the last 18 months has um, been a real keen reminder of, of how lucky we are to be able to, to get out there and see the world. And I mean, I've, I've you know, tried to make this my, my entire life, really, ever since I was 18 years old. I made the decision quite early on that um, I was going to somehow dedicate my life to travel and that's what I've done through different careers different iterations everything from you know early student wanderings uh, you know as a as a backpacker through to my sort of early forays as a, as a sort of photographer and um, filmmaker being in the army you know that was another form of travel in its own right and then really Really, the last 10 years since since leaving the army, um, you know, I put all my eggs in one basket and went, you know, full whack at, um, at trying to turn what really was my boyhood dream into a reality and, and, and trying to combine all my hobbies and passions of photography, writing, filmmaking into one. And uh, luckily, it's all paid off. And um, you know, I feel very fortunate to be able to, uh, to do what I do, going on expeditions and sharing those findings through documentaries, through, uh, through art, through writing and storytelling, really. And that's that sort of front and centre of, of what I do. And in, in doing so, I've, uh, you know, I've visited pretty much every kind of environment out there. I've, I've been to 120 something countries and, um, and it's been an incredible journey. How have you stayed away from the nine to five? Because it's something that so many people get captured by that so many people try to get out of and never do. How did you stay away from it? I think from, you know, the, when I was at, at university, I suppose, you know, as a kid, I always set my sights on wanting to travel. You know, I grew up in a, in a little village outside of Stoke-on-Trent, um, which, you know, I was very fortunate to grow up to two teachers, you know, and the, the importance of curiosity was, was instilled in me at, at a very young age. But I, it was hard to find many mentors in, in, in that environment. You know, not many people really had traveled. The concept of, of going away on a gap year, you know, it's quite a common thing these days. But, you know, when, when I was 18... I looked around and I couldn't find anyone that had really done that, um, you know, and, and very much the norm was going away for two weeks to, to, to the Mediterranean or whatever. And, and that was it really. So when I said to my parents that I was going to go and backpack around, you know, South Africa and go hitchhiking across Zimbabwe and, and places like that, I was met with a bit of bewilderment. Um, and I think it was those early experiences, particularly at such a young age that, that really taught me not to believe everything you read on the news and to have a bit more faith in humanity. So I just took more and more, I suppose, calculated risks. I started hitchhiking in my teens, just A to B. Um, one, because I had no money, and two, because I just met such amazing people. And so, in, you know, in my student holidays, you know, I remember 2003, it was a pretty poignant year. It was the year of the Iraq war. I was curious as to see what the Middle East was really like. So I decided, me and a mate, we decided to hitchhike across the Middle East and we ended up going to Iraq in the middle of the war and, and things like that, which I look back and was probably a little bit reckless, but, 
you know, the fact that I came out the other side gave me a really quite unique perspective for a, for a 20, 21 year old. Um, so I built on that throughout my sort of early 20s. And uh, I I'd studied history at university and, and did my dissertation on um you know, the Grand Tour and the, 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 all the sort of big overland journeys that have become associated with travel writing. So the Silk Road, the, uh, the pilgrimages to, the, to Jerusalem and things like that. So I decided when I was 21 that I should really do my own big pilgrimage. And, and I hitchhiked to India from, um, from Nottingham. <laughs> and uh, it literally put my thumb up on the on the A1 and um, headed south down to Calais and got on a boat to uh you know across the channel and then suddenly i was in europe and went through russia i went through iran afghanistan was that and, and was that the 500 pound tour was that the five that was a 500 quid tour I did, yeah i did five months literally on a budget of 500 quid because that's all i got left in my student loan um but that really taught me uh, about independence it taught me about having to really put your faith in humanity because you know, when you've got a budget like that, you've really, you, you, you know, you can literally eat once a day. And I was having to just, like you say, I was, I was pretty much homeless. I was roughing it and um, relying entirely on, on the kindness of strangers. That's, did, that's got... so exciting to hear. And you've obviously been there and been through all that. But do you think it's possible in this day and age? And there will be people out there that do it and there'll be Instagram travelers and all these sorts of things. But is anyone that you're aware of or do you get people still to this day thinking of doing it as rough as you did? So I'm mm. taking this amount of money and I'm, I don't know when I'll be back. And that's where I'm heading for. I mean, I think, it, I think it's possible in any age, in every age, you know, there's always been people who've wanted to push the boundaries, who've um, tried to be, I guess, pioneers in, in whatever travels. I mean, you know, every age has its challenges. I, you know, when I went through places like Afghanistan in 2004, there was a window of opportunity. You know, it was, it was relatively safe, certainly, um, it got much more dangerous after 2006. Um, you know, Iraq, it was, but then again, you know, going to Iraq, it probably couldn't have been any more dangerous when I was there. So, you know, there's always going to be challenges, borders open and close. You've got to, you've got to be careful. You've got to be, you don't want to be reckless. And um, all the risks that I've taken on my travels, have, you know, I've, I've been thought through and I've, I've considered the relative dangers, but always trying to remember that, you know, basically most people are good and yes you can come a cropper but there's dangers everywhere and you know i love um the author paolo coelho's um quote you know if you think that adventure is dangerous try routine it's lethal and i've always tried to remind myself that in every dangerous situation you know like go to uh, any war zone syria you know it's not like the whole country is aflame all at once and every single person there is 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 um you know is, is in danger it just simply doesn't work like that and that's not to undermine uh you know or take away from the tragedy of a conflict and of course not um it's just to sh- try and keep things in perspective um and i'm not advocating you know war tourism or anything like that it's just a matter of remembering that what you see on the news is only a tiny fraction of the reality of a situation so if you've got an interest in a place, you know, do your homework and, and make your own decision if you want to go there. So I think, you know, there are genuine adventures out there for anyone to, to take. And uh, I just encourage people to, 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 to really look beyond what they're told. Well, that, that's, I mean, I'm, the, the question that's, that I'm sort of, that's oozing out my head is like most people, they're going on a gap year, they're going to Queenstown in New Zealand, or they're, they're going skiing in Chalmany or they do ski season and, and all these sorts of things. And what was it that drew you to the war zones or, or to the places that, I mean, you, how, how often does someone go into a travel agent or go on to one of the websites and book Afghanistan or one of the locations <laughs> that you go to? It's, it's quite unusual that that's, that's where you want to go. Well, don't get me wrong. I went, I went to Queensland and, and, you know, did my, did my sort of time backpacking around Australia as well, you know, and I love that just as much, but I guess for me, I, I wanted to make this my my career. This wasn't just a sort of side hobby. I was always focused on exploring the world and, and, and you've got to take the rough with the smooth. And so um, that was a necessary part of it. I didn't want to just avoid the places that I thought were off limits. It was actually the places that are off limits that, that attracted me the most, not because of the war zones, but because I wanted to tell the stories of the people who live there because actually it's, it's those stories that really need telling because they don't get told very often. And that's what I've, that's something I've tried to take with me throughout my career, particularly the last 10 years is really focusing on the remote communities, the, the, the people that whose stories they don't get told because um, they're sometimes the most interesting. 
Well, absolutely. And I mean, the, the way you, you tell your stories, but from humans to animals and walking with elephants and everything and, and walking the Nile, what's, what's scary? I heard of elephants coming towards you or the, the crocodiles, the snakes and everything <laughs> that's on, along the Amazon. Have you got a, a you clearly don't have a, a major fear for the animals or the unpredictability of them, but what are you like in that environment when it's not a human threat, it's an animal threat? Well, no, I mean, I think I've got a ho- hopefully a healthy respect and fear for, for wildlife. You know, you've got it going through, that's walking through Botswana, like I did on uh, walking with elephants or walking along the Nile, when you've got the, the, the threat of, of being eaten by a crocodile every time you fill your water bottle up. I think it's important to, re- to, to really do your homework and know a little bit or certainly enough to keep yourself safe about animal behavior and um uh, and, and being in the presence of a good guide, actually, and, and I always try and travel with with a local person who knows the area, somebody who can do those human interactions as well as understanding the genuine threats and, and real risks along the way. So it's those people that I've traveled with, really, that have kept me safe because you've got to trust in some of that local knowledge. And, um, yeah, I, I, there's been plenty of times where I've been bricking it because I've been, uh, you know, running away from an elephant or a, or a sort of hippo or something thinking, wow, you know, have I, have I bitten off a bit more than I can chew here? Um, but I, luckily, I've, I've sort of got away with it so far. <laughs> now, how many times, like walking the Nile, how many times are you aware of that you've been to places in the world that no other human being has been? Is there places that, like that that you've been the first there? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's, 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 you know, going through some very re- remote areas like the Darien Gap, you know, which I travelled through on um, on my trip walk in the Americas. Um, you know, it's one of the most remote, you know, jungles in the world. Or, um, you know, climbing mountains in Bhutan where very few people get to go. There's, there's literally hundreds, if not thousands of mountains that haven't been climbed in parts of Central Asia. So, there are still places left to explore, but that isn't necessarily what drives me. It's not the world first or bagging sort of world records. It's it's really the people that you meet along the way. It's the, the encounters for me that that um, are the most interesting bits. And, and again, that comes back to why I travel with, with local people, not necessarily as guides, because a lot of the people I've traveled with, you know, I, I sort of build them as a guide, but sometimes they, you know, they haven't got the faintest clue where they are or uh, they don't even know how to read a map or use a compass but that's not what's important actually what really is important is having somebody with you who is up for the crack who's um a good travel companion and who can keep you entertained and have good conversations with particularly when you're traveling together for months on end do you find yourself leading when you do have a guide or somebody like that that maybe has a is a bit more familiar with the territory but with your background in the paras and, and military background do you sometimes Start taking over, start leading, start start forging on when they're maybe. Well, I don't know. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's about teamwork, really. It's um, it's about making sure you've got the right person with you from the outset. There's no point getting somebody on just because they, you know, know the route. But if they um, are somebody who's going to be really annoying that you're not going to get on with, then you don't want to be travelling with them. Equally, there's no point having somebody who, um, you know, can't keep up or or whatever so i think really it's yeah there's been times where i've definitely had to sort of um take the lead a bit uh particularly if somebody's sort of talking a bit of crap and they don't actually know where they are but they say they do and there's definitely been times like that where you have to sort of use your own judgment just because somebody is a local doesn't necessarily know uh, mean they know everything that's for sure um and you know you've got to back yourself sometimes and i but for me it's it's about picking the right person for the job and actually there's been times where you know alberto who was my guide in for central america he'd never walked anywhere in his life he'd literally never done an expedition but he was so he was just a very funny guy who i knew i'd get on with um so i chose him and i had to be quite patient to begin with because he had to build up his fitness and and so on but actually we just got on like a house on fire and, and actually it was brilliant that says a lot that you actually chose someone because they've got good chat and you're going to get on with them <laughs> rather than that they're, they're a former sniper with thick, ridiculous skills <laughs> and they can get you out of a, a terrorist situation. That, that's that's fantastic to to hear that that's the way you sort of look at these things. It's, it's about the experience. Totally, yeah. And, and actually, you know, you mentioned like, you know, would I choose a sniper or whatever? It's... Um, Sometimes that's the right situation, but actually he, my mate Alberto, you know, what he did have, his good chat actually got us out of so many situations. If I'd have been in, you know, in in the sort of Central American, like Honduras 
ganglands with somebody who's a bit gobby or a bit gung-ho, that might have got us in even more crap. Whereas Alberto, he's so charming and, he's, you know, he's quite sort of camp about it all. He just managed to sort of get us out of these situations just through his natural sort of charm. And we were sort of sitting down with these narco traffickers having a sort of beer because he just completely charmed the pants off them. <laughs> Was, has there been environments that you maybe haven't had in Alberto with you that you felt this might go south, this might go the wrong way? sitting around the table with people or you're in a car that's you thought was going one direction it's actually going the other yeah I mean, it's happened a few times yeah going i was in uh, iraq uh, a couple of years ago doing a trip around the middle east and um you know the, we, the only person we could find to guide me through iraq was was this guy who was a uh, kind of doing the, the propaganda of one of the um sort of militia groups out there so he very much had an agenda but there was nobody else who was willing to look after after me um he got me great access in the fact that we were embedded with some of the frontline troops who were fighting against isis so it meant that we were literally in the sort of point vehicle of the of the uh of the battle um which we weren't really expecting but it was it, it meant that we got some incredible footage and stories um but also uh you know there were a couple of times there where i was thinking hang on have i I got myself into a situation that I shouldn't be in um, because he was very much pushing the agenda that like film this, go film this. And, and actually it was, it was pretty dodgy at times. <laughs> and, and how have you taken to the, so you do so much in front of the camera, but behind the camera and filming things and, and getting those photographs, do, do you enjoy both just as much as being there, being, being in front to, to behind the scenes? Yeah. I mean, the photography side of things was, that's always been my sort of passion, really my, my hobby. You know, I took up photography, uh, a long time ago, just as a bit of fun. And then when I left the army, um, I knew that that would, was going to be sort of uh, central to, to what I was doing. So, um, you know, I was doing weddings and taking photos of babies for a, for a little while, whilst I was building up a bit of a portfolio to start getting published and started winning competitions. So that's kind of, I came into, you know, being in front of the camera was never really my um, aspiration. That was, that was just nice to have um really that that, that happened um uh, off the back of doing these journeys anyway you know i was i've always been doing photography I was, i've always been writing and the tv side of things kind of happened uh much later on yeah the way you explain how your first book or transcript wasn't picked up you tell me that story just that you didn't sure. give up you kept going you had an idea you thought it was good but people weren't sort of jumping on it and you, you had to just keep keep knocking on doors and keep sending it out yeah, so the, the the trip that I did when I was twenty two, I hitchhiked, like I say, from uh, from Nottingham to uh, to India across the old Silk Road um, on the budget of five hundred quid. I I just kept you know I kept notes and a diary, and then when I was in the in the sort of last few months of me being in the army, I thought oh, I'm I'm going to write this up and see if anything will come of it. Um, and I pitched it far and wide to agents and publishers, and literally everybody said no, and it was quite demoralising. But by this time, I'd written a hundred thousand words. And I thought it was pretty good, um, but I knew that I needed to do something to to, to build up my own profile, so um, and credibility. So I spent another three years really creating expeditions. I set up a travel company, leading groups, um, and working very much behind the scenes. And that's how I ended up doing Walking the Nile. So another six years went by. Actually, so I did Walking the Nile. That that was a success. I got a book deal off that. Um, and then two more expeditions. I, I did um, wrote Walking the Himalayas and then Walking the Americas. And it was only after the, the third published book, my publisher was, I sort of mentioned to my publisher that I'd got this 100,000 word manuscript sitting on my laptop. And he said, oh, that's a great idea. Uh, maybe you should publish that. And, and I didn't tell him that he turned it down six years before. But uh, either way, it got published. And my first book ended up actually being my fourth book. How do you think th things would be different if that first one had been picked up right at the start, first publisher? Go, we love this, Levinson, and this is going to be a a, a bestseller. Do you think <laughs> you went through six years of adventure, six six years mm -hmm. of digging in? Is this going to work? Am I going to get a, a book deal, or is anything going to change? I think uh, you know sometimes if you get success too early on, then you kind of lose some of the drive and ambition. And actually, being turned down, you've got to really focus on what are the positives. And it just made me even more determined to do even more stuff and, and, and you know, really work harder. So I always try and look at what, I, you know, what you might consider failure. There's always some positivity in it. There's always an opportunity to be found. 
And you might not see it at the time, but if you try and remind yourself that there is always something, there is always that silver lining um, to be to be sought after, then it, you change your perspective. And so, um, yeah, I think it probably made me work all that much harder to get what I wanted. What was the, I mean, the art of exploration? Curios- curiosity is something you've mentioned already. And I've got three children and I mean, their curiosity is endless. They're never mm. sitting still. They're always wanting out the si- 20 to 7 this morning, I was in the sea with my daughter because she was up and she was asking, where are you going, Dad? And, well, come with me. So that's something I really try to get my family into is, is out and about and outdoors as much as possible. What sort of reaction do you get from, from parents and, and people out there when they think mm. about kids or when you, when you look at our future generations of we are in a world of computers and phones and TV and sit at home and Netflix, you know? Yeah, we are. And, you know, it's, there's, there's a lot of distractions out there. But also, I, I think there's, there's always going to be that section of, of people, you know, whether they're young or old, it doesn't matter. There's always, there's always a certain percentage of people that are curious. And I think it is genuinely hardwired into our DNA. We are curious uh, beings, you know, and, and we need to satisfy that curiosity. And travel has always provided a great outlet. Um, so we can kind of complain about society and um, uh, you know when we do live in a pretty you know we're we're all wrapped up in cotton wool and and but i think you know taking risks is part of who we are it should be encouraged um not recklessness but calculated risk taking because without risks there is no there's no opportunity or less opportunity for self-development and growth as people so let your kids get Get out there, let them explore, let them climb trees, let them go on the gap years, you know, and it's going to, they'll come out better people. Otherwise, if they're stuck at home, like you say, just sort of being scared about the world, then then that fear just continues and it's and it's a pretty pernicious cycle. So, um, it, you know, I don't think it did me any harm. I think um, that curiosity, you know, encourages you to always try and better yourself. And, and for me, that's been an integral part. It's not just about going to places and saying you've been there. It's about what, do you, what can you learn from those experiences and how can you improve yourself and in doing so, encourage and inspire other people. And how do you think we're doing as a human race with looking after our world? You, you've seen so much of it. You've seen, I'm sure, the good, the bad. I, I recently interviewed an event, um, environmental scientist from Australia and he mm. He put the shits up me, to be honest, about the way our world's going and the rate that the barrier reefs reducing, the rate that yeah. we're killing our own our own world. What, what do you see when you when you've travelled, and, and what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty terrifying, you know, place, frankly, when it comes to the, the rate of destruction. You know, I probably sum this up best in my book, The Last Giants, which is about um, the the right, you know, it's the rise and fall of, of the African elephant, but the elephant isn't. You know, it's just, a, you know, sort of analogy for every species and, and the world itself, because I, I sort of talk a lot about, you know, what are the what are the biggest issues surrounding the world? And we, we're often, you know, the, the old cliche, that the, what is the white elephant? And, and the biggest threat, you know, is, is not going away. It's the fact that as a human race, we are growing and growing and using up more resources. And it's not just straight up, pop, you know, overpopulation, of, although that is an issue. It's the, the, the rate at which we are using up resources and, and we're not being sustainable. And it's it's the it's the failings of, you know, uh, every kind of society. We're not looking long term here. And uh, as the human population grows, natural habitats are being destroyed biodiversity falls. And in doing so, it just speeds up the rate of destruction. Um, and at this rate, you know, we're not going to have much wilderness left. And, and it's in those wilderness areas that we are able to maintain biodiversity. If we don't have that, if bees disappear, if elephants disappear, if the key sp- keystone species around the world disappear, that's such a knock-on effect on other species, on plant life, on, on forests, um, and ultimately on us, because it means that there's going to be, you know, the, the, the lack of um, sort of oxygen being produced um, to counter CO2 emissions and so on has huge impacts on, on the ice caps, on the, the, the sort of, you know, global warming and everything else. So, we kind of tend to focus on the slightly smaller low hanging fruit and see the, the little wins w- without actually focusing on the biggest issues of the day, which is basically trying to be more sustainable, uh, use less resources or use them in a manner that is, is more sustainable and encouraging um, basically the, the, the slowing down of, of, of the human population, because that is a huge issue. 
the environmental scientist that I had on EM, he had a great, quite a cheesy video on YouTube. But he basically mm. walks into a room and he's dressed, fancy dress, he's, he's the world. Okay, he's Earth. And he speaks, mm. sits down and speaks to his boss, boss and the boss says, what is it, world? And he says, you know, the last 18 months, the COVID, everyone's been at home and I've kind of had a, I've had about 18 months off. And I'm feeling, I'm feeling quite good. Is there any chance I could get another 10 years off? How do you think the world's dealt with COVID? You know, like there's not been as many planes in the sky. There's not much, been as much traffic, CO2 emissions and all these sorts of things. But how do you reflect on what we've sort of been through? And as we sort of get out now and the world sort of returning to some sort of normality? You know what my take on it? I mean, it's, 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 an, it's a microscopic blip. It doesn't make a blind bit of difference to the bigger issues, frankly. You know, it's what, if anything, it's meant that more people are turning a blind eye to those bigger issues. The fact that during COVID, governments around the world have got away with blind bloody murder, frankly. You know, in Brazil, the, the, the chopping down of the Amazon has continued unabated. Across Africa, poaching has increased because people are getting more desperate. And, you know, there's less resources, there's less funding for charities, for organisations, for rangers, things like that. So I think, you know, using excuses like it's it's COVID certainly hasn't it hasn't helped any matter. It, it's made it a lot worse, in fact, because people's eye has taken off the, the more important issues. COVID is a mere distraction. It's, it's really not a big issue compared to some of the other much huger issues that are we're facing right now. Well said. Well said. That's a, a, a very honest and true way to look at it. Yeah, I suppose. And and. I certainly don't think of it like that, that who has gained from this, who has, if there's not as many, if there's not as many rangers, the poachers can go and get away with a lot more. Yeah, all these sorts of things. Have you seen that firsthand? Have you seen poachers in Africa? Have you seen people or vans disappearing in the distance after a kill and all that sort of thing? Or how close have you Yeah, got? I mean, you know, I've seen it. I've seen it myself all over, you know, Africa um, and not just Africa. You know, the, the sort of, there's, there's a huge, there's a correlation with, um, you know, when when people get desperate, when there's poverty, when there's a lack of education, the you know wildlife, um, and and not just in terms of going to to kill bush meat to eat for your family, although that that's certainly an issue as well. But let's say you've got you know you're you, you're suffering de- dreadfully from poverty, and you've got nine children in Nigeria. Um, you wanna you wanna grow your garden um, by another acre, right? And the neighbours need to do the same. So incrementally, every year. Uh, the wilderness areas get eaten into to grow somebody's cabbages. And you can't blame the local people for that. They need to eat. They need to feed their children. But over the, over the course of a decade, then there's suddenly another, you know, thousand or 2000 acres of forest that have just been chopped down for the sake of cabbages or whatever it might be. And the, the same is happening in the Amazon. The same is happening all across Africa. Another hundred years there will be no forest left. So it's not just poaching. It's, it's very much the habitat loss is for me one of the biggest issues that that's, that's, that the world faces. Uh, and you, know, you might think, well, why is that? Why is that a problem? What does it matter? But the, the problem is, you know, unless we can face these issues, that there simply will be no wildlife left and there'll be nothing left to anybody to eat. So it's about sustainability. It's about education ultimately, because if you can encourage people to say, rather than having nine children, only have six uh, or five or four, you know, over the course of, 50 years then there might be some way of helping to preserve the resources that we do have left but it's it's a very tricky uh, question it's a very tricky subject to tackle particularly in the developing world um particularly where there are you know a, you know aspects and big issues to, t- to tackle like the you know colonialism and so on it's, it's a tough 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 question to uh, to, to raise really and do you think it needs to be driven through schools and universities or just straight to parliaments and and you know it's 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 all of the above really it's about education generally i think female education is 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 such a huge priority um because if you can give communities if you can give young girls particularly hope then there is less chance they might get married when they're 14 or 15 and incrementally by default that means they'll have two less children over the course of a lifetime and so you know, the UN predicts that the, the human population will stabilise, but not until the end of the 21st century. So that's another 80 years away. It's the damage that's done in the next 80 years, really, that we've got to be concerned about. We're going to go from 7.7 billion people that we have now to somewhere between 11 and 12 billion people in 80 years time, which is a huge, huge leap. What's going to be left of the world in 80 years time? Your guess is as good as mine. But the chances of, you know, the megafauna like elephants and hippos and 
Giraffe's been still around in that time, very, very slim unless we act now. So we've got to tackle those big questions. We've got to hit those big issues in the face. Otherwise, there'll be what will be left for our children and, uh, and their children. Yeah. And just as scary like Germany this week with the flash floods and the deaths that happened there and into the Netherlands and, and um, the surrounding areas, it's terrifying what, what's going on. And we see Miami is gradually getting further and further underwater and they're having to build the city up. There's lots. Of, does that sort of side of things worry you as well? Not what we are. Yeah, of course. You know, it's 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 all part of the same same issue. You know, in the West, we've got such a huge responsibility to lead by example here and um, and be more sustainable, use less resources. But the, you know, the system that we live in only encourages growth. You know, capitalism basically just talks about growth. How do we enter new markets? How do we sell more produce? Well, we should really be reframing the question because if we don't, there's not really very, you know, there's not going to be very many opportunities to sell anything to anybody if, if uh, you know, all these big cities on the, on the, um, on the coastline are underwater, frankly, and, and that will happen if we get, you know, anywhere between a 1.5 and a 3% rise in, in global temperature, you know, there's going to be huge issues and, and consequences happening in the next few years. And there's already, you know, a report came out the other day about um, the 2030s are going to see such violent surges in in um, in different weather patterns, which which might mean, you know, more of these floods and desertification. What happens if, you know, another 10 percent of Africa becomes desert? Huge amounts of migration, urbanization, more and more resources being taken up. And and that was going to have a knock on effect um, in terms of people wanting to leave and, and, and come to Europe. And, and so all of the issues that we're seeing a sort of glimpse into now are going to be magnified hugely um, over the course of the next decade. Yeah, two, we, two decades. I'm based just outside Edinburgh, so on the, the East Coast here. And the weather is fantastic at the moment. And we're all basking in it. We're all jumping in the sea. Mm. We're all loving it. But we're not really thinking that maybe it shouldn't be like this. It's maybe a bit of a problem or something that's it's slightly unusual. We're enjoying it just now. But our future generations... Is it going to be too hot for them? Is it going to be, is it going to be completely uncomfortable and unable to go outside for my kids, children, my grandkids, and all these sorts of things? I don't think mm. I, I've said it before that I, I'm guilty of it. And I think many of us are that we don't think about the future impact of what's going on. We enjoy what's happening right now because oh, we're on our summer holidays. Yeah, of course, and, and that's just the nature of being, you know, human. Or well, being we're an animal. Ultimately, we, we're sort of looking at we're looking after ourselves. We're not thinking in a hundred years time and, and how do we, we've got to just think a bit more long-term. Um, but look, the world's going to be fine. The world will, will overheat, will all die out. And then the world will just regrow itself. It's no, you know, the world's not going anywhere, but we might. What do you think of um, Mars and uh, Branson getting into, <laughs> getting into galactic and all that sort of stuff? You're very much feet on the ground. What do you think of space travel and all that sort of stuff? I mean, yeah, look, I uh, what happens when we get to Mars? Who wants to go and live on Mars? I don't want to get, live on Mars. I'd rather be I'd rather be here in London than on Mars, frankly. So perhaps we should maybe focus a little bit more on what we have and the opportunities we have here. You know, if if, if a billionaire wants to go and you know spend all his money on a rocket, then that's his. That's up to him. But I think there's there's a responsibility first and foremost to to try and uh, you know fix what we've got right now. Yeah, I agree. But but would you go? If there was a ticket and Branson said, um, I, don't know, I don't know whether I'd go to Mars, you know, I'd, I'd quite like the opportunity to go and sort of uh, get on a rocket and go and see what the earth looks like from up there. But, um, but I think for now, and I'll, I'll wait until, uh, I'll wait until a few more guinea pigs have gone up yet. <laughs> and I mean, that's something as well, that obviously photography and social media and all these sorts of things. But what about tech? Because back in the day when you went traveling, 500 quid in your pocket, what is it like now with it, sort of the way you travel these days? What, what do you take with you? Have you got sort of your, your go-to things, notepad, camera, bits and pieces? Is there anything a bit uncommon or really futuristic that you think that is a tool that I wouldn't leave home without now? I mean, you know, smartphones are a, a sort of blessing and a curse. You know, it's, it's so easy now. You don't need anything else. You can literally just go with your phone. You can pay on your phone. You can go on Google Maps on your phone. You can book a hotel. You literally don't need anything else. And I remember when I first started backpacking, when I hitchhiked around the world, you know, you had to have a big, chunky, lonely planet guidebook. Um, or if you were a bit bit of a cheapskate like me, you'd get your old school sort of camera and take some photos like the one in the library and sort of just like scan through. Um, 
uh, uh, you know, and, and I'd phone home once a month or whatever using a sort of a scratch card um, or I'd go to an internet cafe. Things have changed. Um, and I think, I suppose the negatives are, whereas if I wanted to find uh, a hotel, I'd get out at the bus station and I'd have to go and ask a local. They wouldn't be able to speak English. I couldn't speak whatever language, you know, they're, they're speaking there. And um, they'd probably invite me into the house. And so I'd meet the family and I'd make a friend for life. And I'm still in touch with some of the random people um, that I hitched lift with in, in Georgia or in, uh, you know, Tajikistan or wherever, because there wasn't the, so there wasn't the ease um, that comes with modern technology. So I actually, I think looking back, it was, I had a greater experience, a more, more fulfilling experience when things were more difficult. So I don't think technology necessarily has, has uh, improved the quality of travel. It's just made everything a lot more efficient. You know, I don't have to speak. If I can't be bothered to speak to somebody, I don't need to, I'll just go on my phone and I'll be able to sort of fix it all. Um, but, but yeah, it has taken some of the joy out of it. I'll be honest. Uh, and now I have to force myself, you know, if, if I want to have relive some of that experience, I'll go somewhere. I'll go, you know, three years ago, I did a rafting trip down the, the Colorado River and I didn't have phone signal for 21 days. And it was the most magical experience because I, was, I just felt disconnected for the first time in ages. So I think you've got to make time for that. You've got to, I think we should all make time to be disconnected because I think there's something quite magical in that. Has it ever been pitched to you by an, uh, a publishing company or a TV crew or something like that to say, do that, recreate your 500 pound trip. <laughs> Just start. No technology. Do it as you did before and see how far you get this time. And I think nostalgia uh, can be, a dub, again, a double-edged sword because I think if I were to do it now, maybe I'd be so sad at the way the world's changed, it would be quite too, a bit too overwhelming and upsetting. Um, I mean, I did actually recreate part of it. I, so back in 2017, I went. So I did a, made a TV documentary called From Russia to Iran, and it retraced um, the sort of second half of that journey uh, from the Black Sea to Iran. And, um, and I actually reconnected sort of a decade later or 15 years later or whatever it was with, um, with some of the people I'd stayed with. And that was, that was quite, that was quite cool actually. Um, but go back to your point of technology, you know, you can't fight the, the, the sort of, uh, the tide of time and you've got to embrace it ultimately. And, uh, look, I've, I've got my phone with me and, and it's part of what I, what I take with me on my travels and uh, my laptop usually comes with me as well. And I've got a very nice digital camera and, and that gets me some nice photos. And I think you just have to accept that the times are changing. Yeah. What about you? We'll touch on your military career just a little bit, but I, I do enjoy the story of how you got into the Paras because you're quite handy with your fists and um, not bad in the boxing <laughs> ring. And that, that basically created the opportunity for you over a few beers. Yeah, it did. So back in 2005, 2006, when I was at Sandhurst, you know, you, you have to choose a sport to, to, to play on Wednesdays. And uh, I decided, you know, I'd done a bit of boxing at uni, so I thought I'm going to give it a go because if you are selected to fight on the fight night, which is the sort of end of term, um, it's quite a prestigious, prestigious event. And um, out of the, I don't know, 40 or 50 people um, that, that sort of decided to box, you know, it's, it's, you're chosen as long as you don't miss any of the, the training, you've got to turn it, you've got to show that dedication and the final 20 are selected to fight each other. So there's 10, 10 bouts and, and I was chosen. And, um, and actually it was, it was such a fun night. I mean, it was quite daunting to be boxing in front of a couple of thousand people in, in the arena. Um, but everybody who box gets taken into the sergeant's mess, um, which, was even more daunting because the sergeants until that point are just these sort of meatheads that shout at you and you're quite terrified of. So you're suddenly you're having a beer with them in their sort of home environment. It's quite an unusual experience. And uh, I was approached by the parachute regiment regimental representative who said, who are you joining? And I'd sort of decided I was thinking between like the intelligence corps, which is a bit more cerebral and my local infantry regiment, the Staffords. And uh, he was like, no, you should join the Paras. And he, he basically said, do you want an interview? And I knew that there'd already been about 100 applicants for the Paras and they were already down to their final 12 applicants because um, the, the process had gone. And I just assumed that I wasn't going to be good enough for the Paras. I was never necessarily the fittest bloke or whatever. So he was like, look, if you're if you're uh, if you're willing to put yourself in that environment, if you're willing to stand in the ring, then, you know, we'd like, I'd like to interview you. So there and then with a beer in hand, I got my first interview, got fast tracked to the final 12 and made it through to the, to the final cut of six. So 
Um, that was how my paras journey began. And actually, I think life would have been very different if I hadn't gone to the paras because the paras has a certain reputation that precedes it. And, and it certainly opened a lot of doors for me. So perhaps if I hadn't have volunteered to do boxing all those years ago, then life might have been a very different um, journey. And, and that's you ended up as a soldier in many war zones that you'd actually been as a tourist. Correct. Yeah. So I'd already hitchhiked across Afghanistan. I've been to Iraq. So turning up as a 20, <laughs> you know, three year old into my battalion, um, having been to those places, I think a few of the other soldiers there thought I was a bit nuts, but, um, but actually I think quite a, a significant portion more um, gave me a bit more respect because I'd already been there and I've been there dressed as a local in disguise, you know, with a beard and sort of sneaking about. Which did you prefer? Tourist or soldier? Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. I mean, I'm very proud of my service in Paris. You know, I, I think I learned a lot in Afghanistan uh, when I was there in 2008 on tour. Um, and I made amazing friends with, with, you know, with my fellow soldiers. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of sad looking back now, 15 years later, that, you know, we're pretty much handed over to the Taliban. Um, and hopefully there will be some benefits of of the of those tours but but to be honest it's probably unlikely really it's it's it seems a bit vain and futile in hindsight um you know for me the best times in my life have been when i've just had total freedom to go and do what i want and uh yes there's potentially risky situations but i quite like going out and uh giving people the benefit of the doubt and, and trying to find the, the positives in humanity yeah and what's um What's, what's next for you? I mean, COVID, is COVID affected, obviously, travel and things, but has that mm -hmm. given you time to reflect, to, to, to write more, to, to sort out photographs, albums, everything you've done over your career and, and really take stock of what you've achieved? Or was it just plan, plan, plan? Well, I mean, I, you know, like everybody else, I, I lost sort of 12 months work. Um, I had all my trips cancelled. Um, very tricky, actually. And for the first time, stuck in one place for, for months on end. So, it, you know, I... There was a period where I hit rock bottom myself, but uh, but I tried to find you know some positives and you know off the back of it, I've somehow managed to do quite a lot of writing. I've published my first photography book, um, which which has been great, um, and that sort of details all my encounters with all the the people that I met around the world. Um, and yeah, in this book, my latest book, The Art of Exploration, really, it was something I started a long time ago, but COVID gave me the opportunity to sit down and write it properly. So um, so really, this is the product of, of, of my COVID experience and lockdown is just to analyze my motivations, to, to pick um, some of the anecdotes that I've not used before and told in my previous books and to make some sense of it and, and make some sense of the, the most valuable lessons that I've learned from my 20 years of traveling and put them down and hopefully there's a lot of takeaways in there for people in whatever life they lead mm. um so that's what i've tried to do what's next let's see let's see if we're we're allowed out properly and how long this unlocking will last um you know i'd like to get back on the road again i've got lots of ideas of other expeditions i'd like to do but equally i'm trying to i'm diversifying a bit as well i've i'm, I'm working on my first novel which is which is a totally different um kettle of fish but i've i found it really enjoyable we moved on slightly there but you did mention you hit rock bottom through through lockdown and things like that. what does that mean to you how, how hard was it for you and was that the fact that you you maybe weren't in control of where you could go and what you could do yeah it was the lack of freedom it was it was being uh, you know, I, you know, I live on my own. It was, it was, it was really tough, you know, and, and not seeing my friends and family and, uh, you know, just a, a combination of factors. My dog died. I broke my ankle. So I was just kind of, there was, I was stuck in a wheelchair, you know, at Christmas time on my, on my own. It was, a, it was a pretty grim experience. So what can you do? You got to sort of, uh, count your blessings and realize that people, other people have got it much worse and, and crack on. Was there any, um, you know, thousands of people did all these challenges at home. You didn't walk, 10,000 miles or anything around your lounge or anything like that? Was there anything that you <laughs> well, did? Well, not really. I mean, I tried to take up a, a few hobbies. I um, I took up paramotoring in between the lockdowns whenever I was allowed out. I decided that um, I was going to go and do some flying, which I, I absolutely hated. You know, believe it or not, even though I was in the paras, I've always had a fear of heights. And so I thought I need to get, this is, I need to get over this. So I took up paragliding and paramotoring and that's how I broke my ankle. So <laughs> it didn't really, uh, but it hasn't put me off. I'm still doing it. So, uh, yeah. And, and what, about, what about that? I mean, there's the oceans, there's the mountains, there's, 
there is, you've done so much, as it, what you could say, walking and on land and, and incredible things, but is there anything that people wouldn't expect you to do that's maybe been on your radar or that's been floated to you? Someone said, what about this? And it's, sort of, oh, maybe look at that. Is there anything people wouldn't um, expect you to do? I mean, it's been, you know, when you're on TV, you get a lot of offers of ra- very random stuff, you know, like I've had... So I've been you know, asked if I want to go and build a cabin in the woods and live in it for 12 months. I've been asked if I want to go and, uh, you know, go to the North Pole, the South Pole, this, that and the other. So I've, I've, I get these amazing opportunities and I always have to think, oh, do I? But I'm, I'm just like, what is it? Do I really want to do this or is it just going to be a sort of distraction for a bit while I, fo- you know, while I should be focusing on other things? So, you know, don't get me wrong, I feel very, very privileged to be able to uh, to have these opportunities. Um but I, there's something that I quite like about having boots on the ground. I, I feel more connected when I'm just walking because I get to meet people. I'm not I de- I, the idea of rowing across an ocean. I, I, you know, I get for some people it's like an absolute dream come true. I can't think of anything worse, to be honest. <laughs> uh, that's that's my idea of hell. But maybe maybe that, all the more reason to do it, perhaps um, as a personal challenge. Um, you know, there's lots of things I'd still love to do. Um, but yeah, it's it's finding the time, isn't it? What what about YouTube? Do you have your own YouTube channel? No, I don't. I mean, I actually um, I was encouraged um, to uh, do some during lockdown. I, I read my because I wrote a children's book actually, so I, I I do have a YouTube channel, but there's not much on there. I just do um, I've done some readings of my children's book for kids because they weren't at school. And what's the children's book called? Um, it's called Incredible Journeys, and it's basically uh, like historical journeys, everything from Marco Polo to, you know, Neil Armstrong on the moon, but for kids. So uh, it's hopefully encouraging kids to, uh, to, to, to enter the world of exploration themselves. Well, that, that's it. And that's, that's why I, I love reaching out to guys like yourself in, in, in adventures. I've got Molly Hughes coming on soon, who's been up Everest a couple of times and all these sorts of things. And, and people that y- you guys are out there and you're doing it. And I can do so much as dad. And it's, it's trying to make the, my kids and other kids and other mums and dads see that here's the stories. Here's the people that are out there doing it. And it's okay for you to try. It's okay for you to have a go. And I just, yeah, I, I that, you know, I, I didn't grow up with a silver spoon in my mouth, you know, and, and I, I think it's important to give people the confidence and say, you know, what, well, give it a go, you know, aim high and see what happens. And, and that really is something that I've always felt was very important is that's part of my duty and responsibility having done what I've done is to help other people try and do the same and that's why I work with a lot of children's charities a lot of educational organizations and uh, things like the Duke of Edinburgh's award you know encouraging young people to to not just be constrained by their own uh, social setting and upbringing actually just go and give it a go. Last question, last thing I want to know is, can you go on a normal holiday? Can you actually just go and lie on a beach, chill out, relax, or is it all... And, and that's the other thing. Would you ever book two weeks or would you book like your first night somewhere and then explore somewhere? What's it like? How extreme do you get when you even just go on a holiday? I, I literally just got back from my Ibiza last night to avoid the uh, quarantine. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, I can go on a normal holiday. I, I was out there for a, for a few days, for what, for a week. And uh, and yeah, sat on the beach and enjoyed the sunshine. So yeah, I, I don't mind that at all. So you can go in and you can go into a war zone with a rucksack <laughs> on your back, but you can also sit on the beach with a, with a drinking hand and you can, exactly. you can do both well. Good on you. Levinson, it's been fantastic to have you on. Thank you so much for joining you me. You too. Thanks for having me. Really good to chat. Good man.